In this video, we shall be showing that the Greek fathers taught the Filioque. A common argument made by Eastern Orthodox apologists is that the Greek fathers, specifically the Cappadocians, rejected the Filioque and upheld the monarchy of the father. For anyone who has researched this topic, they know this is blatantly false. The Greek fathers taught both the monarchy of the father and the Filioque. In this video, we shall show that St. Cyril, St. Epiphanius, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Athanasius, and St. Basil taught the Filioque. Now, there are other Greek fathers that taught the Filioque, but you could see this in my up-and-coming book once it is released. Now, let's get started. Now, let's cover the basic dogmas of the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches regarding the procession of the Holy Spirit. The Eastern Orthodox Church professes that the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father alone with no intermediary. This means only the Father communicates being, essence, and existence to the Holy Spirit through spiration, which is unique to the Father alone. The Catholic dogma is that the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father and the Son, or from the Father through the Son, meaning the Father and the Son are one principle of spiration, communicating essence being in existence to the Holy Spirit from all eternity. Now, what is the Eastern Orthodox position of the Spirit proceeding through the Son? At the Council of Blackernay, in the Thomas against Beckles, Canon 4, the Eastern Orthodox assert, it does not, however, mean that it, the Holy Spirit, subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through Him and from Him. For this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source. So according to the Eastern Orthodox, the Holy Spirit does not hypostatically proceed through the Son, meaning the Spirit does not receive being, essence, and existence through the Son. Otherwise, the Son would be a cause of the Spirit. In the Thomas against Beckos, Canon 5, they assert, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity, except the Father's, from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So the Father alone communicates existence and essence to the Holy Spirit. If you teach the Spirit receives being from or through the Son, you are cut off from the Eastern Orthodox Church. According to the Eastern Orthodox, the Spirit proceeds from or through the Son energetically or according to eternal manifestation. Furthermore, this could also apply to economic or temporal procession. For Catholics, the Spirit is said to proceed hypostatically from the Father and the Son and from the Father through the Son. The Ecumenical Council of Florence, Session 6 states, Texts were produced from the divine scriptures and many authorities of Eastern and Western holy doctors, some saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, others saying the procession is from the Father through the Son. All were aiming at the same meaning in different words. Furthermore, the Spirit can be said to proceed from the Father and the Son or through the Son economically or energetically if this is not divorced from hypostatic procession. In summary, Catholics believe the Spirit receives being, essence, and existence from the Son or through the Son, whereas Eastern Orthodox believe the Spirit receives being, essence, and existence from the Father alone. If we are working on the presupposition that either the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church is the true Church, it follows that if Catholicism is correct on the Filioque, then Eastern Orthodoxy cannot be the true Church, as they have authoritatively rejected it. Likewise, if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone with no intermediary, then the Eastern Orthodox Church would be the one true Church, as the Catholic Church has authoritatively rejected that doctrine. Remember, this is because the true Church established by Christ possesses all the truth and cannot bind the entire Church to heresy. See Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Now let's show that the Greek Fathers taught the Spirit receives being, essence, and existence from the Son or through the Son, thereby showing that they teach the Filioque. St. Cyril was the Patriarch of Alexandria. He was most well known for being a defender of Orthodox Christology against Nestorius at the Council of Ephesus. He is a saint in both the Orthodox and Catholic Churches. Catholics consider St. Cyril to be a doctor of the Church. It was primarily through the writings of St. Cyril that the anti-unionist John Beckos, Patriarch of Constantinople, came to believe in the Filioque. In Thesaurus 34, found in Patrologia Greca, Volume 75, 608 AB, St. Cyril says, quote, Therefore, if Christ, by renewing and transferring us to new life, is said to renew by the Spirit, according to the psalmist, Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. It is necessary to confess that the Spirit is from the essence of the Son, for as He naturally exists from Him, and is sent by Him into creation to enact renewal. This indeed completes the fullness and perfection of the Holy Trinity. If this is so, then the Spirit is God, and from God, and not a creature." End quote. St. Cyril asserts that the Spirit is from the essence of the Son. The term from the essence is used by the Church Fathers when they refer to hypostatic origination alone. St. Athanasius in De Synodus, paragraph 41 says, quote, For confessing that the Son is from the essence of the Father, and not from other subsistence, and that he is not a creature nor work, but his genuine and natural offspring, and that he is eternally with the Father as being his word and wisdom, end quote. So according to St. Athanasius, 
the son being from the essence of the father is nothing other than being the natural offspring of the father or hypostatic origin from the father. St. Basil in letter 52 paragraph 3 says, quote, And when we are taught that the son is of the substance of the father, begotten and not made, let us not fall into the material sense of the relations. For the substance was not separated from the father and bestowed on the son. Neither did the substance engender by fluxion, nor yet by shooting forth as plants their fruits. The mode of the divine begetting is ineffable, end quote. According to St. Basil, the Son being of the substance of the Father refers to the divine generation of the Son from the Father. Therefore, when St. Cyril says the Spirit is from the essence of the Son, he is clearly asserting that the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son, meaning the Holy Spirit divinely proceeds from the Son. This directly contradicts Eastern Orthodox dogma that says the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Father alone. St. Cyril goes on to say that the Spirit naturally exists from the Son. This clearly does not refer to the reception of an uncreated energy that is really distinct from the divine being, nor does it refer to a temporal procession. Neither is this regarding mere consubstantiality and identity of essence, as we do not say and cannot say the Son is from the essence of the Spirit or exists from the Spirit. In fact, this contradicts the Eastern Orthodox Council of Thomas against Becco's Canon 5, which states, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. Finally, St. Cyril completes this passage by saying, If this is so, then the Spirit is God and from God and not made. The Holy Spirit is God from God because he is from the essence of the Son and exists from the Son. Likewise, the Son is God from God because he is from the essence of the Father and exists from the Father. St. Cyril is clearly a filioquist. In Thesaurus 34, found in PG 75 585a, St. Cyril says, quote, Receive the Holy Spirit, so that being transformed again into the original image, we are conformed in nature to the Creator by the participation of the Spirit. Therefore, since the Holy Spirit sent to us makes us conformable to God, it is evident that He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Clearly, He's of the divine substance, proceeding substantially in it and from it. End quote. The Holy Spirit is said to substantially proceed from the Father and the Son, showing this is regarding a hypostatic procession or the communication of essence not an energetic procession. St. Cyril comes to believe in this hypostatic procession from the fact that the Son breathes the Holy Spirit in the economy of salvation and the Spirit conforms us to God. So according to St. Cyril, economic actions of the divine persons reveal their hypostatic origin. In the source 34, found in PG 75 600D, St. Cyril says, quote, Therefore with Christ as a lawgiver, as the Holy Spirit naturally exists in him and from him, he himself enacts the law, end quote. Once again, St. Cyril explicitly teaches that the Holy Spirit receives natural existence from the Son, not temporal existence, directly attesting to the filioque. In the source 34, found in PG 75 588a, St. Cyril says, quote, It is thus clear that one who shares in the Holy Spirit really knows the Lord Jesus, while one who is not a participant remains ignorant. How then does one participating in the Spirit know whoever the Lord Jesus is? Therefore, just as those who taste of honey know its sweetness by its quality, even so, one who becomes a partaker of the Holy Spirit knows the Lord Jesus. Therefore, from the essence of the Son is the Spirit, having some quality in order that we might speak thus with God being Lord over all. The Holy Spirit's relationship to the Son is compared to sweetness, which is the quality of honey, showing that the Holy Spirit naturally issues forth from the Son in the same way sweetness issues forth from honey. St. Cyril then goes on to say that the Spirit is from the essence of the Son. As we have previously shown, the Son being from the essence of the Father is nothing short of hypostatic origin. So the Spirit being from the essence of the Son is nothing short of hypostatic origin from the Son. Notice that St. Cyril acknowledges one who becomes a partaker of the Holy Spirit knows the Lord Jesus. So the Spirit manifests the Son in the economy because he derives being from the Son. In the source 34 found in PG 75604b, St. Cyril says, quote, Therefore, if signs and wonders are accomplished through Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a certain natural living and, so to speak, quality of the divinity of the Son, the Holy Spirit. But if this is so, how can that which is in God and from God be a creation by nature? End quote. St. Cyril describes the Holy Spirit as a quality or attribute of the divinity of the Son. The crux of what he's getting at is that the Spirit's hypostatic peculiarity is that he's of the divinity of the Son. Remember that St. Basil says the Son is of the substance of the Father, insofar as he has hypostatic origin from the Father. Therefore, if the Spirit is a quality of the divinity of the Son, 
This means he has hypostatic origin from the Son. St. Cyril then follows up by saying that the Holy Spirit is in God and from God, showing this quality or attribute is with regards to hypostatic origination. In Thesaurus 34, found in PG 75, 584a-C, St. Cyril says, Through which it is necessary that the mystery of the Holy Spirit be taught, and to understand that it is indeed a certain fruit, just as it is of the divine essence, being in the same divine essence and proceeding from it undividedly and inseparably, and being united according to this identity naturally. But we have the mind of Christ. We speak all things to the disciples, not from some private will or even from another, but as proceeding or issuing forth from his essence, having his entire will in operation, but we have the mind of Christ. Therefore he affirmed that the Spirit will not speak from himself alone, just as I am the one who speaks, as a mind and a man speaks of the speech that proceeds from it. He will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears he will speak. And certainly no one will ever say that this common and vocal speech of man is something imperfect, because it is formed first in the mind and then proceeds from it. For the natural unity quickly transmit what is in the mind into speech. Similarly, it is to be understood regarding the Holy Spirit, since he is the mind of Christ, everything that is in him is spoken to the disciples, not in some private wish, nor even in a will belonging to another, but as proceeding or issuing forth naturally from his essence." End quote. Notice that St. Cyril calls the Holy Spirit a fruit of the divine essence. Elsewhere he calls the Son a fruit of the Father. If the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father alone, we would expect that he would be called the fruit of the Father as well. But instead he is called the fruit of the divine essence, which indicates that he proceeds from the union of the Father and the Son, as we have previously demonstrated. St. Cyril asserts, the Spirit is in the same divine essence and proceeding from it undividedly and inseparably, indicating the Spirit proceeds from the union of the Father and the Son. He continues calling the Holy Spirit the mind of Christ. It is interesting to note that we call the Son the word of the Father because of his hypostatic origin from the Father. So it is not far-fetched to say that the Spirit being the mind of Christ is likewise indicating a relation of origin. St. Cyril then continues and says the Spirit is proceeding or issuing forth naturally from his, Christ's essence. This is a clear attestation to the filioque, as it is a natural procession from the essence of the Son, something that indicates the communication of essence from the Son, in the same way the Son proceeds from the essence of the Father. Remember St. Athanasius and St. Basil assert that being from the essence or of the substance of another divine person simply refers to hypostatic derivation. Therefore the Spirit originates from the Son according to St. Cyril. This is why the Spirit has the Son's entire will, just as also his entire operation. The hypostatic procession is the basis for the energetic procession. In the source 33, found in Patrologia Greca, volume 75, 573c, St. Cyril says, quote, Since life is by nature from the Son and from the Spirit, which is supplied by him, the Son, then it is necessary to agree that he exists from the essence of the Son and God. The Holy Spirit is said to be supplied by the Son and to exist from the essence of the Son and the Father. Notice how we cannot say the reverse. The Son exists from the essence of the Holy Spirit, as this would imply hypostatic origination. Therefore, St. Cyril is explicitly teaching the Spirit has being from the Father and the Son, a clear attestation to the hypostatic filioque. In De Adoration et Cotu in Spiritu et Veritate 1, found in Patrologia Greca, volume 68, column 148a, St. Cyril says, quote, The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father as well as of the Son and comes forth substantially from both, that is, from the Father through the Son." End quote. St. Cyril says the Spirit is the Spirit of both the Father and the Son. He then says the Spirit comes forth substantially from both, that is, from the Father through the Son. This is a substantial procession, so it cannot be referring to a temporal or energetic procession. Remember St. Basil and St. Athanasius assert that the substantial and essential processions are hypostatic processions, not energetic ones. St. Cyril then equates the hypostatic procession from both to the Spirit's procession from the Father through the Son, explicitly vindicating the Council of Florence, which says, Some saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, others saying the procession is from the Father through the Son. All were aiming at the same meaning in different words. In Commentary on John, Book 11, Chapter 1, St. Cyril says, But it is because he is consubstantial with the Son and divinely proceeds through him, being inherent in the substance of God, he proceeds and issues from it, and has innate in himself all that the nature implies. In this way, then, the statement that his spirit receives something from the only begotten is wholly unimpeachable and cannot be cavilled at, 
for proceeding naturally as his attribute through him and having all that he has in its entirety, he is said to receive that which he has, end quote. St. Cyril says it cannot be denied that the Holy Spirit receives all that he has from the Son. Can this be true if the Holy Spirit does not receive essence and being from the Son? Of course not. Therefore, it is clear that he affirms that the Holy Spirit receives his personal being from the Son, as demonstrated from the previous quotes. Because of this, we know that his hypostatic property is that he divinely proceeds through him. This shows that St. Cyril affirms both hypostatic filioque and procession per filium. Remember that Photius in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit 21 says, What other persons from whom the Spirit is said to receive could be meant other than the Father, because it cannot be, as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son, and it certainly cannot be from the Spirit, whom himself does the receiving. Therefore, St. Cyril definitively contradicts this Eastern Orthodox pillar of orthodoxy. Objection. St. Cyril did not teach the filioque. Theodore's letter 171 confirms that St. Cyril rejects the filioque. Dr. Edward Sachensky claims, quote, Cyril denied he held this teaching, the filioque, leading Theodore to confirm the orthodoxy of Cyril's Trinitarian theology, end quote. Reply to objection. Theodore in letter 171 asserts, Quote, we have assembled together and read the Egyptian letter. St. Cyril affirms that the Holy Spirit is not of the Son, nor derives existence from the Son, but proceeds from the Father, and is properly stated to be of the Son as being of one substance. End quote. So Theodore of Cyrus thinks St. Cyril does not teach that the Holy Spirit derives existence from the Son, based on his reading of the Egyptian letter. And this brings him great joy. Now the Egyptian letter is Cyril's letter to John of Antioch, letter 39. The only time the procession of the Holy Spirit was mentioned in letter 39 was when St. Cyril said, quote, But the Spirit himself of God and the Father, who proceedeth also from him, and is not alien from the Son according to his essence, end quote. In no way is this either confirming or denying the filioque. Nowhere does St. Cyril assert that the Spirit does not derive existence from the Son. Theodore read that into the text. From all of the evidence mentioned beforehand, it is clear that St. Cyril taught the filioque. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas recognizes this as well. In De Potentia, he writes, Again, Theodore in an epistle to John of Antioch expresses himself as follows, The Holy Spirit does not come from the Son, nor has he his substance from the Son, but he proceeds from the Father. He is called the Spirit of the Son because he is consubstantial with him. Now the above words were attributed by this Theodore to Cyril, as though he had written them in a letter which he wrote to John of Antioch, and yet they are not to be found there. Furthermore, modern Cyrillian scholarship also agrees with the fact that St. Cyril did not retract his belief in the filioque. Father Gao's Emery O.P. writes, A. de la Hilu has shown that Cyril's formula of reconciliation does not imply any underlying change or recasting of his thought. Therefore, this objection fails. Summary. St. Cyril explicitly teaches the filioque. He says the spirit exists from the sun, is from the sun's essence, and substantially and essentially proceeds from the sun. Additionally, he says the Spirit issues forth naturally from the Son, divinely proceeds through the Son, and receives all things from the Son. So the Spirit being from, through, and receiving from the Son all indicates hypostatic origin from the Son. If this is all merely referring to eternal manifestation as Eastern Orthodox claim, then we can say that all the times that St. Cyril says the Spirit proceeds from the Father is also merely referring to eternal manifestation and not hypostatic procession. However, clearly this is a false and ad hoc move, and not an accurate reading of his works. Let's move on to St. Epiphanius. St. Epiphanius was the Bishop of Salamis. He is known for the Panarion, an account of 80 heresies and their refutations, which ends with a statement of Orthodox doctrine, as well as his Ancaratus, which is a compendium of the teachings of the Church. He is a saint in both Catholic and Orthodox churches. In Ancaratus 67.1, St. Epiphanius says, quote, If Christ is believed to be from the Father, as God from God, and the Spirit is from Christ or from both, as Christ says, who proceeds from the Father, and this one will receive from what is mine, end quote. When St. Epiphanius says Christ is from the Father as God from God, this is referring to hypostatic origination, as the term God from God is used. If the context is about hypostatic origination, then when St. Epiphanius says the Spirit is from Christ or from both, he's asserting this with regards to hypostatic origination showing he believed in the filioque. Notice that his belief in the filioque is from his exegesis of John 15.26 and John 16.14, where we see that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and receives from Christ. Now, most Eastern Orthodox will say John 15.26 is with regards to the hypostatic procession of the Spirit, 
So the use of John 16.14 in parallel to John 15.26 shows both are revealing something about the Spirit's hypostatic origin. Clearly, if the Spirit receiving from Christ in John 16.14 influenced St. Epiphanius to hold to the Filioque, this is nothing short of the Holy Spirit's reception of being in essence from Christ, directly contradicting the Eastern Orthodox Council of Lacrone. In Ancaratus 4.6, St. Epiphanius says, And again to the Son, true light, and to the Father, light, in order that as we bind together the two beliefs, Concerning the divinity, we might confess about the Father true God, and about the Son true light, about the Father light, and about the Son. From light and God, let us confess the one divinity, and from true God and true light, the one unity of power. In Ancaratus 73.2, St. Epiphanius says, The Son who is from the Father, true light from true light. In Ancaratus 71, 1-2, he says, But someone will say, Therefore we say that there are two sons, and how then is he only begotten? No. Who are you speaking against God? For if he the Father calls the one from him Son, and the Holy Spirit the one from both, what alone is by faith being thought by the saints, that he is shining, illuminating, and has illuminating activity, and makes a harmony of light with the Father himself? By faith listen, O man, because a Father is Father of the true Son, entire light, and the Son is Son of the true Father, light from light, not in Appalachian alone, as things which are made or created, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, Third light from the Father and the Son. End quote. We see that in Ancaratus 4 6, the term light is used in reference to the divinity of the divine persons. Then in Ancaratus 73 2, the Son is called true light from true light because he receives the divinity from the Father. In Ancaratus 71 1, we see that there is one person who is from the Father alone, that is the Son, and the Spirit who is from both. This is with reference to the hypostatic peculiarities of the persons as St. Epiphanius is picking out the persons based on their properties, clearly showing he forms a filioque. If this is not clear enough, in Ancaratus 71.2, he says, The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, third light from the Father and the Son. If being light from light is with reference to the hypostatic derivation of a person from another person, then the Spirit as third light from the Father and the Son clearly attests to his hypostatic derivation from the Father and the Son. In Ancaratus 73.1-2, St. Epiphanius says, Quote, if therefore he proceeds from the Father and receive from what is mine, the Lord says, just as no one knows the Father except the Son, nor the Son except the Father, thus I dare to say that no one knows Spirit except the Son from whom he receives, and the Father from whom he proceeds, and no one knows the Son and the Father except the Holy Spirit, the one who truly glorifies, the one who teaches all things, the one who bears witness concerning the Son, who is from the Father and the Son. End quote. The Holy Spirit is once again said to proceed from the Father and receive from the Son. As seen in our previous analysis, St. Epiphanius sees the Spirit's reception from the Son as the same thing as the Spirit's procession from the Father, meaning they both refer to hypostatic derivation. He then says the Spirit is from the Father and the Son, showing that he equates the filioque formula with the Spirit receiving from the Son. Remember that Photius also recognizes this, which totally contradicts the Eastern Orthodox innovative doctrine of energetic procession, which reads the Spirit receiving from the Son as distinct from hypostatic origin. In Panarian against the Arian Nuts 54 3-4, found in PG 42 285 CD, Saint Epiphanius says, But here there is a sender and a scent, showing that there is one source of all good things, the Father. But next after the source comes one, who to correspond with the name of Son and Word, and not with any other, is one source springing from a source. The Son come forth ever with the Father but begotten, without beginning and not in time as the scripture says. For with thee is the source of life. And to show the same of the Holy Spirit, it adds, In thy light shall we see light, showing that the Father's light, the Son is the Father's light, and the Holy Spirit is light and a source springing from a source that is from the Father and the only begotten, the Holy Spirit. End quote. Saint Epiphanius says the Son is one source springing from a source. The Son come forth ever with the Father but begotten. So the Son being source from source is in reference to his hypostatic origin from the Father by being begotten of the Father, in a similar way that he is God from God. Saint Epiphanius then continues this line of thought and says, The Holy Spirit is light and a source springing from a source, that is from the Father and the only begotten. If the Holy Spirit is source from source, this is once again referring to hypostatic origin. Notice that the source or hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit is the Father and the Son. Also see how he says the Holy Spirit is source springing from a source that is from the Father and the Only Begotten, and not source springing from sources, showing St. Epiphanius believes the Father and the Son are one principle or one source of the Holy Spirit, not two principles. In short, he teaches the hypostatic filioque. 
Notice at the beginning, St. Epiphanius says there's a sender and a sent. So the economic sender sent relationship finds its foundation in the hypothetic origin relations of the persons. In other words, the Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son because he receives being from the Father and the Son. In Panarian against Anomoeans 44.3, St. Epiphanius says, quote, I myself therefore do not worship anything that is inferior to the essence of God himself, since it is proper to accord divine honor only to the Absolute, to the ingenerate Father, the Son begotten of him, and the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and through the Only Begotten, since nothing in the Trinity is created and falls within the province of causation. End quote. Saint Epiphanius starts listing the hypostatic properties of the persons. He first says the Father is ingenerate, and then he says the Son is begotten of the Father. Notice that this does not refer to an energetic procession or a temporal procession. Both of these are in reference to the hypostatic personal properties of the divine persons. When he gets to the Holy Spirit, he says, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and through the Only Begotten. So the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property is that he proceeds from the Father through the Son. This directly contradicts the Council of Black Renate Thomas against Beckles Canon 4 which says, To the same who affirmed the Paraclete, which is from the Father, has his existence through the Son and from the Son, and who again proposes proof the phrase, The Spirit exists through the Son and from the Son, we cut them off from the membership of the Orthodox and we banish them from the flock of the Church of God. End quote. In summary, here we have an Eastern Father clearly teaching that the Spirit's hypostatic origination is from the Father and the Son, from the Father through the Son, and equating this with the Spirit receiving from the Son. Saint Epiphanius, just like Saint Cyril, shows that all three formulas are with regard to the eternal origination of the Spirit, and not referring to an eternal manifestation nor economic procession, as the Eastern Orthodox claim. He also shows that the Father and the Son are one source of the Spirit, aligning with the Catholic dogma that the Father and the Son are one principle of the Holy Spirit. Now let's move on to St. Gregory of Nyssa. St. Gregory of Nyssa was the Bishop of Nyssa in Cappadocia. He clarified Trinitarian theology against heretical opponents and played a significant role in the Council of Constantinople 381, where the procession of the Holy Spirit was discussed. St. Gregory of Nyssa was also a mystic who lived a monastic life. He's venerated both by Catholics and Orthodox. In Sermon 3 on the Lord's Prayer, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, On the other hand, the being not ungenerated is common to the Son and the Spirit. Hence, in order to avoid confusion in the subject, one must again search for the pure difference in the properties, so that what is common be safeguarded, yet what is proper be not mixed. For he is called the only begotten of the Father by the Holy Scripture, and this term establishes his property for him. As for the Holy Spirit, it is said to be from the Father and is testified to be from the Son. For it says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Hence the Spirit that is from God is also Christ's Spirit. But the Son who is from God neither is nor said to be from the Spirit. And this relative sequence is permanent and inconvertible. Hence the sentence cannot properly be resolved and reversed in its meaning. So that as we say the Spirit to be Christ, we might also call Christ the spirits. Since therefore this individual property distinguishes one from the other with absolute clarity. But as on the other hand, the identity of action bears witness to the community of nature. The right doctrine about the divinity is confirmed in both. Namely that the Trinity is numbered by the persons, but that it is not divided into parts of different nature. End quote. St. Gregory of Nyssa acknowledges that the Son and the Spirit share something in common that is not an essential property. This common property is being not ungenerated, or in other words, they are both from the Father. Here he affirms that there may be properties common to two persons, paving the way for the Latin concept of notions, which are properties either proper to one or two persons. Continuing forward, since the Son and the Spirit share being not ungenerated, or proceeding from the Father, there must be something more to distinguish them, to prevent their hypostatic properties from being exactly the same while keeping their essential properties common. St. Gregory of Nyssa follows along, stating, He is called the only begotten of the Father by the Holy Scripture, and this term establishes his property for him. St. Gregory of Nyssa connects the genitive or possessive case to the hypostatic property of the Son. Since the Son is the Son of the Father, his hypostatic property is that he is begotten of the Father alone. He then applies the same logic to the Spirit and says, As for the Holy Spirit, it is said to be from the Father, ek and it's testified to be from, at the Son. So the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property is to be from the Father and the Son, not from the Father alone. This is derived from the possessive case. We see the saint state, Hence the Spirit that is from God is also Christ's Spirit. But the Son who is from God, neither is nor is said to be from the Spirit. And this relative sequence is permanent and inconvertible. So the genitive case and the relative sequence cannot be converted, since they mirror the hypostatic relations and personal properties. In other words, we cannot call the Son the Son of the Spirit. Otherwise, this would imply that the Son proceeds from the Holy Spirit, which is absurd. We can call the Spirit the Spirit of the Son, since the Spirit is from the Son. 
This is then confirmed when he says, since therefore this individual property distinguishes one from the other with absolute clarity. The Son being from the Father alone, and the Spirit being from the Father and the Son, are the hypostatic properties that distinguish the persons. There's no way this can refer to a temporal procession or energetic procession, since this is regarding the properties that distinguish the divine persons. In short, we have a Greek father explicitly teaching the Filioque. If St. Gregory of Nyssa played a significant role in the Council of Constantinople 381, where the procession of the Spirit was declared, we have precedence to believe that this affirmation of the Filioque shows the Filioque does not contradict the Creed of 381. Objection. The Eastern Orthodox rendition of Sermon 3 on the Lord's Prayer does not include the section of the Filioque. The second ek pertaining to the Son, the portion which states the Spirit is from the Son, is not included. This is a Latin interpolation. Reply to objection. The literary and manuscript evidence shows the Filioque is a genuine portion of the sermon. In Cardinal May's edition of the text, the fragment included the second ek, was cited by the Doctrina Patrum de Verbi Incarnation, which is as early as 700 AD. The Codex Vaticanus Grecus 2066, 7th or 8th century, contains the sermon with the passage as well. Even F. de Camp shows that the phrases used by St. Gregory of Nyssa occurred, even sometimes verbatim, in other writings of his work, and there were parallels in style and vocabulary. The second ek is even in the oldest Syriac manuscript, which predates the Greek manuscripts. Therefore, this objection is not supported by the manuscript evidence. Additionally, the Filioquist teaching in Sermon 3 parallels St. Gregory of Nyssa's On Not Three Gods, where he states, for one is directly from the first, and another by that which is directly from the first. So the attribute of being only begotten abides without doubt in the Son, and the interposition of the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father. Here we see the distinguishing feature between the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit comes through the Son, matching perfectly with what is presented in Sermon 3. Therefore, the literary evidence points toward the authenticity of the second ek pertaining to the Son. Finally, even if the second ek were not present in the text, and the text only said, the Holy Spirit is said to be from the Father and is testified to be of the Son, this would still teach the Filioque, as the Spirit being from the Father and of the Son is his hypostatic property, which distinguishes him from the Spirit. As we see St. Gregory of Nyssa says, since therefore this individual property distinguishes one from the other with absolute clarity. So given either reading, the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property pertains to the Father and the Son, and is not referred to proceeding from the Father alone with no intermediary, as Eastern Orthodox claim. Thus, the accusation that the Filioque in Sermon 3 is a Latin interpolation is not grounded in objective evidence. Rather, it is an assertion based on personal bias. In On Not Three Gods, found in PG 45, 133 BC, he says, quote, if, however, anyone cavils at our argument on the ground that by not admitting the difference of nature, it leads to a mixture and confusion of the persons, we shall make to such a charge this answer, that while we confess the invariable character of the nature, we do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused, by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another, by our belief, that is, that one is the cause and another is of the cause, and again, in that which is of the cause, we recognize another distinction, the one, i.e. the Son, is directly from the first, and the other, i.e. the Spirit, is through the one who is directly from the first. So that the attribute of being only begotten abides without doubt in the Son, and the interposition of the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father." End quote. St. Gregory of Nyssa affirms that the real distinction of the persons only occurs by relative opposition, the difference in respect of cause and that which is cause, by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another. Since relative opposition is the only way to distinguish the persons, how can the Son and the Spirit be distinguished? According to the doctrine of relative opposition, one has to produce the other if this is the case. This is why St. Gregory says, for one, the Son is directly from the first, the Father, and the other, the Holy Spirit, is through the one who is directly from the first. The Holy Spirit is through the one who is directly from the first, meaning he is caused through the Son. The Spirit being through the Son is what distinguishes him from the Son. So this pertains to hypostatic origination through the Son. St. Gregory says the interposition of the Son guards his attribute of being only begotten. Since the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son hypostatically, the personal property of the Son proceeding from the Father alone is preserved. If this were not the case, both would proceed from the Father alone, meaning they would share the same hypostatic property. St. Gregory of Nyssa continues by saying that the interposition of the Son does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father. So the hypostatic relation of the Spirit to the Son grounds the hypostatic relation of the Spirit to the Father. This is substantially identical to St. Athanasius, who in first letter to Strapion says, the Holy Spirit is said to proceed ek pruitai from the Father because it is from the Word. St. Gregory of Nyssa's pneumatology, taught in On Not Three Gods, is complementary to what he asserts in Sermon 3 in the Lord's Prayer. 
He affirms both hypostatic causality from the Father and the Son, and from the Father through the Son, vindicating the Council of Florence, which asserts that the Father substantially meant the same thing when they used the two different formulas. Eastern Orthodox cannot argue that what distinguishes the hypostatic properties of the Son and the Spirit is that the Spirit hypostatically proceeds through the Son. In On the Holy Spirit Against the Macedonians, found in PG 45, 1308 AB, he says, quote, For the plea will not avail them in self-defense, that he is delivered by our Lord to his disciples third in order, and that therefore he is estranged from our ideal of deity. Where in each case activity is working good shows no diminution or variation whatever. How unreasonable it is to suppose the numerical order to be a sign of any diminution or essential variation. It is as if a man were to see a separate flame burning on three torches, and we suppose that the third flame is caused by that of the first being transmitted to the middle and then kindling the end torch." End quote. The Macedonian heretics were a group who denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. St. Gregory of Nyssa addresses their arguments and asserts that the Holy Spirit being the third person in the Holy Trinity does not make him less divine. He compares the Holy Trinity to three torches, each with a separate flame. He says the first torch, the Father, lights the second torch to the Son, and the second torch to the Son lights the third torch to the Holy Spirit. As he says, the third flame is caused by that of the first being transmitted to the middle, and then kindling the end torch. Later he asserts, the third torch being fire, though it has been kindled from a previous flame. The symbol of torches and the communication of the flame is clearly with respect to the eternal origin of the persons, as the flame is symbolic of possession of the divine nature, or that which ensures the divine persons are God and not mere creatures. So the giving of the flame is the giving of the divine essence, or the eternal processions of the persons. With this illustration, the Father communicates the divine essence to the Son, and the Son communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. This can also be seen as the Father communicating the divine essence to the Spirit through the Son, as the first torch gave the flame to the second torch, which gave the flame to the third torch. This clearly shows that St. Gregory of Nyssa believes the Son has an active role in the eternal origin of the Holy Spirit, directly contradicting Eastern Orthodox dogma. St. Gregory's torch analogy clearly shows that the Father is the first cause and source of life within the Godhead, maintaining the monarchy of the Father. Yet the Son holds the Father's spirit of power, and the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from both the Father and the Son, or from the Father through the Son. In Against Eunomius, Book 1, Chapter 42, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, quote, that if in conceiving of the Father before the Son, on the single score of causation, we inserted any mark of time before the subsistence of the Only Begotten, the belief which we have in the Son's eternity might with reason be said to be endangered. But as it is, the eternal nature, equally in the case of the Father's and the Son's life, and as well, in what we believe about the Holy Ghost, admits not of the thought that it will ever cease to be. On the one hand, because the existence of the Son is not marked by any intervals of time, and the infinitude of his life flows back before the ages, and onward beyond them in an all-pervading tide. He is properly addressed with the title of eternal again. On the other hand, because the thought of him as Son, in fact, and title gives us the thought of the Father, as inalienably joined to it. He thereby stands clear of an ungenerate existence being imputed to him, while he is always with the Father who always is, as those inspired words of the Master expressed, bound by way of generation to his Father's ungeneracy. Our account of the Holy Spirit will be the same also. The difference is only in the place assigned in order, or taxis. For as the Son is bound to the Father, and while deriving existence from him, is not substantially after him, so again the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence, only in the theoretical light of a cause, aitias. Extensions in time find no admittance in the eternal life, so that, when we have removed the thought of cause, the Holy Trinity in no single way exhibits discord with itself, and to it is glory due." End quote. St. Gregory of Nyssa is explaining the Trinitarian ordering of the persons, and says we conceive the Father before the Son solely on the conception of causation, or the fact that the Son derives existence from the Father. This conception of the Father being prior to the Son is not temporal, as all persons are co-eternal, so they are substantially simultaneous. This is seen when St. Gregory says, conceiving of the Father before the Son, on the single score of causation. For as the Son is bound to the Father, and while deriving existence from Him, is not substantially after Him. He then continues to explain why the Son is conceived prior to the Holy Spirit. He says, so again the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who was conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence, only in the theoretical light of a cause, Aetias. The Son is conceived prior to the Spirit, based on the theoretical light of a cause, in the similar way that the Father is conceived prior to the Son, based on causation, or deriving existence from Him. Clearly this is showing that the Son is cause or Aetias of the Holy Spirit, which refers to hypostatic origin. 
In other words, since the Son is a cause or ITS of the Holy Spirit, he is conceived of as prior to the Holy Spirit. It is interesting that St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten. This matches with what he says in On Not Three Gods, when he refers to the interposition of the Son, as what distinguishes the procession of the Son from that of the Spirit. The Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten because the Son is the intermediary between the Spirit and the Father's hypostatic relation. Objection. Eastern Orthodox apologist David Erhon asserts that the correct reading is that the Son is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence only in light of a theoretical cause. So the Son is not an actual cause or ITS of the Holy Spirit. He is only a theoretical cause. But my point is there's no evidence from the Fathers of ITS being used in this sense. If there was any evidence, I, we will see it from him, but he in fact concedes that there is no evidence, right? The, the closest one was from St. Gregory of Nyssa, and that's him saying that the Son is a theoretical cause in contrast to the Father being the actual cause. Right. Do you know what that means? That means St. Gregory of Nyssa is saying that the Son is not a cause. Right. <laughs> He's saying the exact opposite, right? Um, in the end of uh, Book 1 against Eunomius. Reply to objection. This reading makes no sense of the context. If the Son is prior to the Spirit, only in light of a theoretical cause, and not an actual cause, how can the Son actually be conceived of as prior? What grounding is there in reality for this conception? If there is no grounding for this conception, then why can't we conceive of the Holy Spirit as prior to the Son based on a theoretical cause? Furthermore, this does not make sense of the parallel given. As St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the Father is conceived of as prior to the Son by an actual cause and not a theoretical cause. This is seen when he says, for as the Son is bound to the Father and while deriving existence from Him. He then compares the Father's priority to the Son by an actual cause to the Son's priority to the Spirit, showing this is in reference to an actual cause, not merely a theoretical one. St. Gregory of Nyssa asserts, So again, the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence only in the theoretical light of a cause, a tias. Finally, we see that St. Basil says something very similar that can shed light on what St. Gregory of Nyssa claims. In Against Eunomius Book 120, St. Basil states, But we say that the Father is ranked prior to the Son in terms of the relation that causes have with what comes from them, not in terms of difference of nature or preeminence based on time. So the priority of order of the persons comes from the fact that one is the cause or principle of the other. Therefore, the Son's priority of origination to the Spirit comes from the fact that He is the cause or principle of the Holy Spirit. Here we have a Greek father asserting the Son is cause or tias of the Holy Spirit, which unmistakably shows the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son. Notice that the usage of the term atias changes throughout time. In this instance, it is referring to generic principle or cause, not to primordial cause. In On the Holy Spirit Against the Macedonians, he says, He, the Holy Spirit, ever searches the deep things of God, ever receives from the Son. End quote. St. Gregory says the Holy Spirit eternally receives from the Son. Remember that Photius, one of the earliest opponents to the Filioque, asserts there can be no eternal or temporal reception of the Spirit from the Son. In Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit 21, he says, What other persons, from whom the Spirit is said to receive, could be meant other than the Father? Because it cannot be, as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son, and it certainly cannot be from the Spirit, whom himself does the receiving. And therefore, St. Gregory of Nyssa directly contradicts this Eastern Orthodox pillar of Orthodoxy. As a summary, we have seen that St. Gregory of Nyssa clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit is from the Son and that this is the Spirit's unique hypostatic property that distinguishes Him from the Son. Sermon 3. We see St. Gregory claims the Spirit is through the Son and the interposition of the Son guards the Son's hypostatic property of being from the Father alone, on not three gods. We see St. Gregory use the Trinitarian analogy where the Spirit receives divinity from the Son or from the Father through the Son while keeping the Father as primordial source of the divinity against the Macedonians. Furthermore, we see the Holy Spirit eternally receives from the Son. So St. Gregory of Nyssa uses the terms from, through, and receives to point to the Son's active causal role in the eternal origin of the Holy Spirit. Now let's move on to St. Athanasius. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, St. Athanasius was the greatest champion of Catholic belief on the subject of the Incarnation that the Church has ever known, and in his lifetime earned the characteristic title of Father of Orthodoxy, by which he has been distinguished ever since. This Patriarch of Alexandria was also a great defender of the doctrine of the Most Holy Trinity. He is venerated both by Catholics and Orthodox, and he is considered a doctor of the Catholic Church. In First Letter to Serapion, paragraphs 20-21, to found in PG 26 580 AB, St. Athanasius says, quote, 
As the Son, the living Word, is one, so must the vital activity and gift, whereby he sanctifies and enlightens, be one, perfect, and complete. The Holy Spirit, which is said to proceed, ek pruitai, from the Father, because it is from the Word, who is confessed to be from the Father, that it shines forth and is sent and is given. The Son is sent from the Father, for he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. On the other hand, the Son sends the Spirit. So if I go, he says, I will send the paraclete. The Son glorifies the Father, saying, Father, I have glorified you. Whereas the Spirit glorifies the Son, who says, He will glorify me. The Son says, Those things which I have heard from the Father are what I speak to the world. While the Spirit, in turn, receives from the Son, He will take from what is mine, He says, and declare it to you. The Son came in the name of the Father, whereas the Son also speaks of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Therefore, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, how can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son? End quote. Saint Athanasius says the Holy Spirit is said to proceed ek pruitai, from the Father because it is from the Word. Notice that the term for procession uses ek pruitai, which is a special term used by the Greek fathers to indicate this is with reference to a hypostatic procession, namely the Father being the first origin of the Spirit. The word ek pruamanon, which comes from the same word as ek pruitai, is used in the Greek Nicene Creed in reference to the hypostatic procession of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, ek pruitai is a term used in John 15:26 where the Holy Spirit is said to proceed from the Father. This term has been interpreted as regarding hypostatic procession, according to the Eastern Orthodox. So St. Athanasius is asserting that the reason the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds, ek pruitai, from the Father, is because he's from the Word. In other words, the Holy Spirit's procession from the Father is grounded on his hypostatic relation of origin from the Son, clearly teaching that the Son has a causal role in the hypostatic origination of the Holy Spirit. Can Eastern Orthodox affirm that the reason the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father is because He's from the Word? They cannot, as they affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father with no intermediary, meaning the Spirit does not hypostatically originate from the Son. Therefore, St. Athanasius directly contradicts Eastern Orthodox pneumatology. What St. Athanasius is saying can be clarified by St. Gregory of Nyssa's Three Torches analogy. In St. Gregory of Nyssa's Trinitarian analogy, the Father is the first torch that has the fire of Himself. The first torch lights the second torch, which symbolizes the Father giving the divine being to the Son. The second torch then lights the third torch, which symbolizes the Son giving the divine being to the Holy Spirit. So the first torch is said to light the third torch from the mediation of the middle torch. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is said to hypostatically proceed from the Father because he's hypostatically from the Son, showing that the Son has an active role in the eternal origin of the Spirit. You will also notice that concerning the shining forth of the Spirit, St. Athanasius says, the Spirit which is said to proceed ek pruitai from the Father, because it is from the Word, who is confessed to be from the Father, that it shines forth. So the Spirit shining forth is nothing other than the fact that he hypostatically proceeds from the Word, showing the Eastern Orthodox interpretation of eternal manifestation that is really distinct from hypostatic procession is contradicted by St. Athanasius. Immediately after this insight, St. Athanasius notices four things regarding the Son-to-Father relation. One, the Son glorifies the Father. 2. The Son hears from the Father and declares Him. 3. The Son comes in the name of the Father. 4. The Father sends the Son. He then notices that this parallels the Spirit-to-Son relationship, so he starts, 1. The Spirit glorifies the Son. 2. The Spirit hears from the Son and declares Him. 3. The Spirit comes in the name of the Son. 4. The Son sends the Spirit. From these parallels, St. Athanasius says, the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father. Notice that St. Athanasius uses the term taxis, which refers to the Trinitarian ordering of the persons. The Father is the first person, the Son is the second person, and the Holy Spirit is the third person, as taught in the traditional baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19. St. Athanasius also uses the term nature, which means this is talking about something regarding the divine nature, not something energetic, nor temporal. Now, what is the Son's relation of nature and order to the Father? The Son receives nature from the Father, since the Father generates the Son, and the Son is ordered posterior to the Father according to taxis, because He proceeds from the Father. In other words, the Father is the first person because He proceeds from no one, and the Son is the second because He proceeds from the Father alone. Now if the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, what is a logical conclusion? 
For this means the spirit receives nature from the son, since the son is a principle of the spirit, and the spirit is ordered posterior to the son, according to taxis, because he proceeds from the son. So the son is the second person, because he proceeds from the father alone, while the Holy Spirit is the third person, because he proceeds from the father and the son. Here we see that St. Athanasius logically concludes the filioque by noticing biblical parallels. This matches perfectly with his assertion that the Holy Spirit is said to proceed ek pruitai, from the Father because it is from the Word. Finally, this makes sense of St. Athanasius' final assertion. How can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son? In short, if the Spirit naturally proceeds from the Son and is a creature, this would imply the Son is a creature because the Spirit takes of the Son's essence. Thus, we have clearly shown that St. Athanasius teaches the filioque. In Third Letter to Serapion, Paragraph 3, found in PG 26, 628C to 629A, St. Athanasius says, quote, Again, the Holy Spirit is called and is unction and seal. Moreover, this unction is a breath of the Son, so that he who has a spirit says, We are a sweet Savior of Christ. The seal gives the impress of the Son, so that he who is sealed has the form of Christ. As the Apostle says, My little children, of whom I am again in travail unto Christ be formed in you. But if the Spirit is a sweet Savior and form of the Son, it is clear that the Spirit cannot be a creature. For the Son also, being in the form of the Father, is not a creature. End quote. St. Athanasius refers to the Spirit as the breath of the Son, the seal of the Son, the sweet Savior, and form of the Son. Now the Son is called the form of the Father because he has origin from the Father and has the likeness of nature to him. If the Spirit is called the form of the Son, then this same logic applies, meaning the Spirit has origin from the Son and has the likeness of nature to him, by deriving the divine nature from him, not by proceeding according to the mode of generation. In Discourse 3 Against the Arians, chapter 25, paragraph 24, he says, quote, For he, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. End quote. Does the Holy Spirit have essence being in existence, yes or no? If not, then you are no longer a Christian, as you deny the existence of the Holy Spirit. If yes, then what does St. Athanasius mean when he says, whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word? It means the Spirit has essence, existence, and being from the Word. If the Spirit did not have essence, existence, and being from the Word, then St. Athanasius would be wrong when he claims, whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. Thus, St. Athanasius is a filioquist, according to your Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackernay. In summary, St. Athanasius teaches that the Spirit is hypostatically from the Son, and this is why the Spirit is hypostatically from the Father. He says the Spirit receives all things from the Son, and that the Spirit is a seal, savior, breath, and form of the Son. Furthermore, he teaches that the shining forth of the Spirit is nothing other than his hypostatic origin from the Son. St. Athanasius is clearly a filioquist. Now let's move on to St. Basil. St. Basil was the Bishop of Caesarea, and he is considered one of the three Cappadocian Fathers. He is a strong defender of Nicene Trinitarian theology, and he wrote works on monasticism as well. He is a saint venerated by Catholics and Orthodox, and he is considered Doctor of the Church in the Catholic Church. In Against Eunomius, Book 2, 34, St. Basil says, quote, isn't it clear to everyone that no activity of the Son is severed from the Father? That none of all the existing things that belong to the Son is foreign to the Father? For he says, all that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine. So then, how does Eunomius impute the cause of the Spirit to the Only Begotten alone, and taking the creating of the Spirit as an accusation against the Only Begotten's nature? If he says these things to introduce two principles in conflict with one another, he will be crushed along with Manny and Marcion. But if he makes the beings depend on a single principle, that which is said to come into being from the Son has a relationship with the first cause, the Father. Hence, even if we believe that all things have been brought into being through God the Word, we nevertheless do not deny that the God of the universe is the cause of all. How is it not an unmistakable danger to separate the Spirit from God? On the one hand, the Apostle hands down to us that they have connected, saying, Now that he is the Spirit of God, now that he is the Spirit of Christ. For he writes, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And again, you have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that comes from God. On the other hand, the Lord says that he is the Spirit of truth, since he is himself the truth, and that he proceeds from the Father. But Eunomius, in order to diminish the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, separates the Spirit from the Father and imputes him exclusively to the Only Begotten, in order to diminish his Christ's glory. End quote. Father Thomas Crean, in vindicating the filioque, says, quote, Saint Basil does not object to Eunomius holding that the Son is a principle of the Holy Spirit, but to the way in which he applies this principle. There are, he says, two ways to understand it. Either the Son is a principle exclusively, 
or else he is in such a way that the Holy Spirit also has a relation to the first cause, the Father. Only the second sense is acceptable. And since St. Basil explains the second sense by scriptural texts, we must assume that he himself holds it to be not only possible, but true that the Holy Spirit is from the Son. Even more than this, the word one in this extract, agreeing as it does with the word principle just before, seems intended to encompass both the from the Son and the relation to the first cause. In other words, St. Basil comes as St. Hilary does around the same time, very close to the formulation that was later to become standard in the West, that the Father and the Son are one principle of the Holy Spirit. End quote. Therefore, St. Basil disagrees with Eunomius that the Spirit was created by the Son as an exclusive principle. Rather, he teaches that the Spirit is eternally produced from the Father and the Son as one principle, explicitly teaching the Filioque. We have shown that St. Cyril, St. Epiphanius, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Athanasius, and St. Basil teach the Spirit's hypostatic origin from or through the Son, directly contradicting Eastern Orthodox dogma. If we are working on the presupposition that either the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church is the true Church, it follows that if Catholicism is correct on the Filioque, then Eastern Orthodoxy cannot be the true Church, as they have authoritatively rejected it. The Greek Fathers teach a Filioque, and for proof that the Latin Fathers teach a Filioque, watch my video, The Church Fathers Taught the Filioque. The consensus of the Fathers cannot be wrong, therefore the Filioque is true. Therefore, the Eastern Orthodox Church is not the true Church established by our Lord Jesus Christ. This means that if one wants to be a faithful follower of God, he must enter into the Catholic Church, as it is necessary for salvation. The most recent ecumenical council in the Catholic Church, Vatican II, dogmatically teaches that entering and remaining in the Church is necessary for salvation. The document, Lumen Gentium 14, says, Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Therefore, if you want to be saved and avoid eternal hellfire, become Catholic. For information about becoming Catholic, contact your local Catholic parish and ask them about RCIA or OCIA. If you are an Eastern Orthodox, now having an existential crisis, I ask that you pray the Rosary. Our Lady appeared multiple times advising all Christians to pray the Rosary. If you want to ask me specific questions, feel free to reach out to me on Discord. My username is Catholic Duong, C-A-T-H-O-L-I-C-D-W-O-N-G. If anything in this video is helpful to you, thank the Lord Jesus Christ through Mother Mary for the graces and assistance in producing this work. If you feel so inclined, it would be much appreciated if you could donate to support my studies and research. Any amount helps. Here's my Venmo if you want to support my ministry. Thank you very much. God bless.